Hello everyone and welcome to the second Field Notes live event. My name is Jordan Vega. I am a soil scientist with the Toland Soil Survey Office in Connecticut and the Region 12 um, representative for the Field Notes. Um, as a regional representative, I serve on the Field Notes Review Committee and the Review Committee solicits and selects topics for each webinar. We have selected three exciting topics for you today and we encourage you to ask questions at any time using the Q&A panel. The Q&A panel should open by default. However, if for some reason your Q&A panel is not open, simply click on the question mark icon located on the right side of your screen. For closed captions, turn on um, the live caption button located in the lower right corner. Today's session is being recorded. Recorded sessions are available in Teams on the Field Notes channel and the National Social Service Center YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy today's session. With that, I would like to turn it over to Dave Hoover to tell you a little more about today's webinar. Dave? Thank you, Geraldine. Hi, this is Dave Hoover. I'm the director of the National Soil Survey Center. I want to welcome you all to the second number two of our Field Notes webinar series. We had a great turnout at the first one. Uh, saw several presentations. We're going to see several more today. And I hope uh, this accomplishes two things. One, that it uh, educates you, lets you know what's going on around the country. And the other thing, I hope it uh, encourages you to present things yourself. Uh, I am always impressed by the depth of activities and types of, of work that's going on out in the field. And I know that other parts of the country are eager to learn what's going on out there too. So please consider sharing your experiences, your knowledge, and your science with others through this Field Notes webinar series. As Geraldine mentioned, we have three presentations today. And let's get going on our first one. We have uh, uh, two people doing this one, uh, Matthew Havens and Zach Warning from the Belmont, New York office. They're gonna be speaking on TSS during a pandemic, one MLRA offices experiences with digital media. Turning it over to you guys. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yep, we hear you good. Okay. Um, the presenting banner is covering where I want to get my slides to show the full, to get to the presenting mode. Down in the bottom right of the screen next to the Zoom bar, there's a button for the presenter mode that you can click uh, right to the left of it. Yeah, just to the right a bit. Uh, two more. There you go. Hey, thank you. And uh, my name's Matt Havens, and the voice you just heard was uh, my uh, new soil scientist, uh, Zach Warning. I've been doing this for 33 years. Zach's been doing it for one, and he's my uh, tech guy. So thank you, Zach. Um, anyway, hi everybody. My name is Matt Havens and I am a soil scientist and office leader in the Belmont, New York MLRA office. And today I'll be sharing along with Zach about our experiences being involved in two videos during our current pandemic. The 12 Bell office is located in Belmont, New York, and we cover about 21 million acres in southern New York, northeast and northwest Pennsylvania, northeast Ohio, and even a tiny sliver in uh, northwest New Jersey. There are two MLRAs, the Lake Erie 
glaciated plateau on the west side and the glaciated Allegheny Plateau and Catskill Mountains to the east and Belmont's pretty much right in the middle. One of the big things that I wanted to highlight today, in addition to the practical side of video production, is that the two videos that we were involved in and are highlighting today are both the result of relationships that we have built. In the first instance, I was contacted by the staff of the Headwaters RC&D Council in North Central Pennsylvania to see if I would be a presenter in a video about grazing and soil health. Due to the pandemic, they canceled all the field days, the pasture walks and the workshops they were planning. So they decided to shoot 11 different videos on topics like riparian buffers, nutrient management, heavy use areas, planting green, cover crops, and also the one that I was part of, among others. A majority of the funding came from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in cooperation with other partners. The reason that I was contacted for this video was my connection to the adaptive grazer Russ Wilson and to, at that time, resource soil scientist Alex Dado. About a year and a half ago, Russ Wilson from Western PA was going to be the featured speaker at a grazing soil health workshop and he wanted input and help from a soil scientist. So he contacted the, as I said, the then resource soil scientist for Western PA, Alex Dado. And as many of you know now, Alex Dado is the state soil scientist in Montana. So Alex was getting ready to go. So Alex said, um, hey, Russ, contact Matt. So I met Russ for the planning meeting. We had a very successful workshop. So later on, when the Headwaters RC&D wanted to do some of these videos with grazing and soil health and other um, conservation practices, they invited Russ and Russ said, hey, why don't you get Matt to do a video? So the opportunity fell right into my lap, really. And it was due to the connections that I had established with Alex and Russ Wilson. Now, the other opportunity, this Envirothon video that we created came about because we have helped out in several local and regional Envirothons over the last 10 or more years. Uh, we love to do them um, and we're actually helping take the load off of some of the resource soil scientists in New York. So as happens every year, we were contacted by the Erie County, New York uh, Soil and Water Conservation District to help them with their Envirothon contest. The difference this year was that it will be it was all virtual and they wanted a either a PowerPoint or a video for the soils training part. Um, I mentioned we've had a long history of working with Erie County Soil and Water District. So I assigned Zach to help him on this training. And the really neat thing is that Zach was actually a participant in this very Envirothon in high school. So he jumped at the chance and instead of just giving them a normal PowerPoint presentation that they could show virtually, Zach wanted to make a video and I said, hey, run with it. It turned out really nice and especially when you consider that we had no, no real budget. Um, that's why I say making connections and developing relationships is important for our TSS workload. Both of these opportunities are the direct result of it re establishing relationships, doing good work, and then leaving a good impression. So if you've been in your area a long time, you probably already have those relationships and connections established. But if you're new to an area, my advice is to take some time, contact the local resource soil scientists, the DCs, the area staff, uh, state soil scientists, et cetera, and let them know you're around. A matter of fact, where our office is located, we're kind of in a dead zone for resource soil scientist coverage. So I've made sure that the state soil scientist of Pennsylvania, URI, uh, knows that we can help. And I've also worked with the New York NRCS so soil staff on TSS coverage for this part of New York State. As you can see here from all the logos, one of the nice things about this grazing and soil health video was that it was part of something bigger than just uh, NRCS. So the grazing video 
was entitled Monitoring Soil Health in Your Grazing System and covered some of the basic things to look at regarding grazing and soil health. Uh, in our coverage area in 12 Bell, we have a lot of grazers, dairy, beef, sheep, are, they're all present. Um, and as you can see, uh, 11 videos were created. Um, I wrote the script and submitted that to the uh, SPSD for review. Um, that's very critical for all of these type of things, and I'm learning that as we go, but very critical. Um, the RCD staff filmed this and recorded it, and then it was professionally edited. So the RCD staff, they use wireless microphones that they purchased on Amazon. They had a dead cat, which is this big fuzzy hairball that you put on top of the microphone to minimize the wind noise. And then they had an iPad Pro that they used on a tripod. So I'm not saying you know what's better or not. I'm just saying this is what they used and uh, it worked pretty well. All right, so now I'm going to go. We'll go to the next uh, video that we were involved in. I'm going to turn turn it over to Zach. Hey everybody, hey everybody. Uh, this is Zach. I'm Zach. the soil scientist working with Matt. So uh, before I arrived in Belmont, uh, the now retired soil scientist Mary Ellen Cook uh, well, used to run the soil section of the Erie County New York Envirothon. And um, funnily enough, I actually met Mary Ellen when I was in high school doing it that very same Envirothon. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Envirothon is uh, just a competition where teams are tested on their knowledge of the natural sciences. And you can head to states and nationals and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I was in the Erie County Envirothon all four years of high school. Um, so I knew that when Mary Ellen retired, if I could, I would have loved to fill her shoes. And that's exactly what I had the opportunity to do this year. And uh, normally I would have gone out uh, into Erie County and, and presented in person and done workshops with the students and, and taught them all about soils and, and things. But uh, times being as they are, uh, I had to do it virtually. And I just knew, I mean, I love soils, but even I would be just put to sleep by an hour long PowerPoint uh, about soils. So I just, I knew it was gonna be a lot more work, but I really wanted to make a video um, soils actually has kind of the lowest average score of any of the sections in Envirothon and soils uh, I think is probably the least covered in high school curricula. So I just knew that if there maybe for some of these students their first introduction to soils was a really bland PowerPoint uh, that was just not going to leave a good first impression of like one of my favorite uh, natural sciences. So. So I started, I looked at the State Envirothon website. Uh, I wanted to see exactly what knowledge they wanted the students to know. And from that, I created my script. And right from the beginning, I knew that because the video was requested to be anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half, I was going to break the video up into sections so that if they had a hard time with one concept or another, they didn't have to search through what ended up being 45 minutes of video just to find like a five minute section. So I ended up with 10 sections. Um, I had what is soil, why does soil matter, soil characteristics, reading the landscape, soil survey, soil interpretations, threats to soil, soil health, summary and objectives, and then at the end I just threw in some recommended resources like videos and other fun things. And then uh, once the script was edited, um, I edited it myself, I had Matt help out, I had Christy Wiley help out, um, once that was edited and approved and everything was all set, I moved on to film planning. So before I even touched a camera, I went through my whole script and color coded everything by what specific environment I would have to be filming in, whether it was me just talking indoors or me doing a demo at the office or me being outdoors or just my voice over a PowerPoint slide or an image. And by organizing it like that, I made the filming process itself as efficient as possible so that after several weeks of intermittent script writing and planning and and thinking about and conceptualizing all this, the actual filming only took three days. So Matt, if you could just uh, move the slide ahead. 
So I was actually fortunate enough to own a professional grade microphone, the Shure Super 55. And I just used that to record myself reading the script in its entirety to be used as a voiceover wherever I needed it. Um, and then I just used the f totally free audio editing software. It's called Audacity uh, to just clip the, the files enough that they had no extra bloopers or anything like that. It was just exactly the audio I wanted it to be. And then I sent that off to our editor who was not just an Earth Team volunteer, but also Matt's son, Ben. Um, he's an excellent editor for audio and video. Um, and then for filming, I also had good fortune in that I am friends with a uh, kind of professional filmographer who used a Nikon D5500 camera and a DR05 recorder to capture many of the indoor scenes. And then for demos inside the office, I just used my cell phone. Uh, I've just got a Google Pixel 4a, uh, nothing fancy. But it's nice that we live in such a time where the camera and audio quality on cell phones is so high that you you can't even notice switching between those scenes shot with a cell phone or shot with a professional camera. Um, and then Ben, to put the whole thing together, make it look really nice and, and really smooth, he used this uh, DaVinci Resolve by Blackmagic Design. It's just a more much more higher end editing software. Uh, next slide, Matt. So in both Matt's and my own case, as Matt said, uh, the script is a must because you want to sound as natural as possible. But if you don't have a script to reference, then you can easily leave out critical information. You can start to ramble um, and getting that script reviewed prior to filming will save you on reshoots and post-production edits and and all sorts of headaches that could be avoided. Um, I found personally that the separate recording of me just reading the script was extremely convenient because when certain shots weren't just were not working out, um, I could always default to a PowerPoint slide or an image with the voiceover. And it made our editor's job so much easier because it gave him way more options. And uh, additionally, just when I was preparing the script, uh, the video and the images, uh, the whole time I was thinking about the editor um, I used numeric symbols in the script for where I wanted slides inserted, and I used alphabetic symbols for where I wanted videos inserted. So Ben, he knew exactly where I wanted what, and it streamlined the whole process. He didn't even have to, you know, we didn't need constant communication. He knew exactly what, what and where I wanted uh, all of my clips and videos. And uh, finally, sound quality is absolutely key. Uh, because if your video is immaculately shot, but the audio is bad, the video can just be unwatchable. Uh, so Matt, if you could just change to the next slide. Um, so to get the video up on uh, the NRCS NCSS YouTube channel, um, we worked closely with Christy Wiley and Tammy Umholtz, who were both extremely helpful. Uh, to get the process moving along. I'm just posting the link in the chat now um, for anyone who is interested it's in the announcements. Um, and so yeah, another basically it's a uh, essential that you're going to work with your editors with your connections in the agency to get that product out. And most importantly, I think from both projects we learned that this creativity of who you're working with and how you're working with them, is essential. Uh, you know, using a videographer friend in my case, or Matt signing up his son because of the particular skills they have. Everybody has connections to so many different people with so many different skills that um, in the end, that sort of creative element kind of, it goes much farther than you would think. And at the end of the day, we ended up with a product that I think everyone who's involved with it is super proud of. And I look forward to making more content like that in the future. Um, so yeah, and uh, Matt, next slide. If anyone has any questions, uh, happy to answer.
Well, I'm not seeing any uh, questions in the Q&A. Uh, we did get your posting of the video on the YouTube site, and I actually brought it up and look forward to viewing that at another time. So if there are additional questions uh, that come to people during the other presentations, uh, be sure and put them in the Q&A and we'll post that and uh, <clears throat> get answers for you. The next presentation is by Travis Weiser out of the Kerrville, Texas office on measuring soil carbon within San Antonio city limits. Travis? Hello, my name is Travis Weiser. I'm a soil, soil scientist in Kerrville, Texas. I serve as the MLRA office leader for MLRA 81 and 82. Uh, today, my talk is titled Measuring Soil Carbon Within San Antonio City Limits. Uh, some background on this project. Uh, there were some special interest groups that are located in Bear County uh that were aware of our rapid carbon assessment project and they wanted to know if it was possible for them to get better information on how much carbon was currently stored within the city limits of san antonio and so back in late 2000 or 2018 early 2019 before covid uh, we started some meetings and had some uh, small meetings with the, the interest, some special interest groups with uh, state NRCS employees and soil survey employees as well. And we had subsequent meetings with uh, st staff members of the city of San Antonio and their parks and recreation unit. Uh, we also had some professors from UTSA involved. And so we had multiple meetings and figuring out what, what we wanted to do, what we wanted to measure, and how would we go about doing this? And uh, one of the things that we had to do was get a memorandum of understanding uh, to give us the permissions to work in the city and on city property. And so to begin, <clears throat> one of the things that we did, which, which was very similar to the Rapid Carbon Project, is we looked at grouping the, the soils within the county. And so here's a picture of Bear County, uh, the red line, is indication of the city limits of San Antonio and the yellow line is the MLRA boundaries. Uh, the soils in Bear County have been grouped to, in 10 different groups right now. Uh, the first grouping was done by MLRA and the second grouping was done by soil depth characteristics and potential of storing organic carbon. Uh, MLRA 87 and 83 which are on the southern boundary of the county are a mix of soils but very similar in current organic carbon storage and the potential to store more organic carbon in the future is very similar. Uh, these groupings that we've made are the a first look and they could change as we have not started any field work with this project at the current time. And so on the left there, you can just kind of see some general description of the soils and how we group those together. The next the, the next layer that we have uh, at our disposal was provided by the city of San Antonio, and this is an impervious surface layers uh, that we can use and the pixel size is five meters, so we have good resolution on this. Uh, and so the blue areas are the impervious surfaces such as concrete roads and parking lots, houses, buildings, etc. So these are areas that we do not plan to look at. We do not plan uh, to open up a hole in these impervious surfaces and look at how much carbon is currently under this pavement or concrete. And then the black areas are those areas where we can access easily the soils and it has some type of organic carbon uh, in it. And with management decisions, hopefully this organic carbon uh, can be improved over the years. The next layer that we have uh, accessible to is the cover kind. Now there is some, um, <clears throat> some potential here that uh, there's, this is not as high resolution as impervious layer. This one's uh, 30 meters. And so there's some, some cell size differences there that issues that we'll have to work out. 
Uh, the cover kind map is another way we can separate sample sites based on different kinds of land cover. The areas within uh, dense juniper trees versus open grassland could have different levels of carbon in the soil. And this is an example of ways we can diversify our sampling sites to capture soil properties and then extrapolate that data into areas we have not been able to get to uh, to get a better picture of organic carbon across the city. And so here you can see from the left on the table, uh, we have diverse cover kinds from uh, evergreen and deciduous forest to open range land, savannas, pasture lands. Uh, we have um, dense buildings to, to low building sites, and we also have some cropland. And so we'll look at, at these in more detail as we move on through the talk today. Another and very important layer that we have that the city of San Antonio gave us is their park systems. And so this is probably as what we're currently thinking we might do a, a two step pro two step sampling process where one is we look at the park systems because they're easy access and they have good distribution across the city. Uh, and then and then we don't we won't have to necessarily involve uh, individual homeowners at this time. Uh, but there's also been discussion about using public school grounds for sampling sites, which could lead into an opportunity to expose more students to soils. Uh, we would also like to capture within these schools when they were built as another way to possibly explain differences in organic carbon. Uh, there has been similar discussion on looking at residential areas by when they were built to possibly explain some of the differences in organic carbon that might that we might find. Uh, because as site preparations have drastically changed over the years as these subdivisions have been built. So now we're going to look at three different parts of the city in more detail using these three layers. And so here's just an aerial view of, of downtown city of San Antonio. Uh, if you're familiar with the city at all, uh, they do have a river walk, which is high, uh, outlined there in yellow on the right hand side. And then I also wanted to highlight uh, Milam Park, which is downtown San Antonio and some of the other layers. This uh, pops out very well. And then we also have the I-35 and I-10 interchange in downtown San Antonio. So here, obviously, in the city downtown, you would expect a uh, high impervious surface layers, which is basically what we see here. Uh, a lot of blue indicating a lot of area covered in concrete. But you can see along the river walk, we do have areas of soil and then the Milam Park uh, does have an areas where water can infiltrate. And then you can see that interchange of I-35 and I-10 pretty well on this impervious layer. And I will also say in this site, all the soil groupings were very were the same uh, with the deep soils with high organic matter expected. You can also see those differences on the cover kind map. Uh, the dark red here is the high density buildings, uh, but you can see along the river walk in Milan Park the absence of, of some of the buildings and you pick up the, some of the pixels where we could be storing organic carbon. Now we will move on to the residential area of the city. Uh, so this is outside the downtown and you can see here on the aerial photo uh, we have a creek system that cuts through the residential areas. Uh, we have our neighborhoods and then we also have there uh, going north and south and then on the bottom the east to west you have some main art artery roads that service these resi residential areas on a daily basis so along these roads you're going to have your small businesses uh, that these residential areas frequent on a daily basis and again here the the impervious layer shows the creek very well because this is a five meter pixel size, so that shows up very well. We have our mixed areas where we have the residential areas and then along that main artery road. Uh, again, we increase in the impervious layer because these are those small local businesses that those residential areas uh, visit on a on a daily basis. Uh, the one thing to consider here is how well organic matter storage should be infected along the creeks, which are mostly native versus lawns of houses, which are mostly typically manicured and some fertilized on a regular basis versus green areas around the businesses along the main artery roads that handle the majority of the day to day local traffic. And so those are some of the things that we're going to have to consider looking at sampling sites 
and how organic carbon is being stored in the soil. And here's looking at that cover kind map. <clears throat> you know, the, the main roads that have a lot of the businesses have higher density buildings. The residential is going to be a mixed and you can see uh, the little green areas along the creek that are have natural ve vegetation. And then moving further out of the from this, the downtown city area, uh, we have an area of mixed use. And here we have a, a shopping center that is going to be high impervious layers, but we also have these areas where uh, no building has occurred. And so I'm going to call these natural areas. We do also have subdivisions with larger lot sizes on some ridge tops, and that's what's there on the left hand side. And then that main road there coming into San Antonio is I-10 on the north northwest side of San Antonio. And so the impervious layer is showing a mixture of uh, the, the black and the blue. And so the shopping center is high concentration of impervious. You have your subdivisions on those ridge tops that is a mix. And then you have your natural areas that have very little impervious layers. And then we also have on the cover kind, we have a good mixture of different uh, cover kinds and plants kinds as well. We have uh, some evergreen forest, which is your dark green thick ash juniper thickets. On the residential tops, we have a uh, mix building uh, densities. And then in the, in the shopping center, we have high density. And then we can have open range land over on the right hand side as well. So we have a, a large mixture here, and this is actually the first time we had a mixture in different soils. And uh, so here's just some looking at some of the different soil groupings that we did. We have uh, a moderately deep soil with dark surfaces and red BTs. We have shallow soils with dark surfaces. Uh, we have some deep soils with deep dark surfaces and clay and a high clay content. And then we also have some deep soils with deep dark surfaces. And then we also have a moderately deep soils with dark surfaces. And then even in that where that uh, shopping area is, that was an old quarry that was still mapped on the soil survey. And so we're going to take these soil samples in our plan to actually measure the or ma amount of organic carbon in the soil is using the mid infrared spectroscopy. A method and so we have one of these lab ovens currently in our office and we're going to air dry the samples at 35 to 37 degrees celsius for three days before we grind it to two millimeters and then once we do the air dry grinding we will place it back in the oven for another 24 hours uh, just to make sure we have all of the excess moisture uh, taken off because moisture uh, will mask the and interfere with the mir scans once that is done, we will do a fine grind uh, using the stretch MM200 mil. And the protocol is to fine grind it at for 15 minutes at 25 hertz. And this has shown to mimic the fine grind that is done at the KSL, KSSL lab in Lincoln, Nebraska. And so we will get good correlation uh, between the two labs. And then once that is done, we will scan the soils using the Bruker Alpha 2 mid infrared spectrometer and then using the Opus software on our computers and we will get be able to get scans uh, from those samples and then produce an um, a prediction of organic carbon that was in the soil. And the last step here uh, or just if you're not familiar with mid infrared spectroscopy, it is similar to the Viz NIR that we use for the, ra uh, the rapid carbon assessment project. It just uses a little bit different uh, range of wavelengths. And so the mid infrared uses the, the red box there in the middle uh, from 2500 to 25,000 nanometers. And the visible and near infrared, it would have been just to the left of this box where you have those visible lines and then just to the right of, the, of that. So a little bit different wavelengths that we're using here, but we get better signatures from some of the soil properties. And so before we get started on any of that, uh, I haven't built any models yet, but I did look into the LIMS database. And currently in Texas, we have 351 sites that are available that have KSSL data and have MIR scans completed on them. And so on this map here, the blue points 
are pedons that have been sampled. Uh, these are exact locations. And then the red points are pedons that have information, but it was missing Latin long. And so we have mapped the, the county centroids just to have an idea of what part of the state it came from. So with that, uh, the next step is to get out in the field and take samples and build my models. And with that, are there any questions? I'm not seeing any in the Q&A window, Travis. But I thank you for the presentation and I'm sure folks will be able to contact you as they have questions pop up. Thank you. Before we go to our uh, last presentation for the day, I would like to remind people that the next webinar is going to be held on May 11th. I can't remember if we're filled up for this agenda yet. Let's say no and that we are needing more presentations. So uh, you can contact uh, um, the organizers, the, your local folks or the national folks and get your uh, topics in so we can get them included into, if not the next one, then the one after that or the one after that, because we're going to be doing this for a while. So our last presentation today is going to be from Max Ross uh, from the Olympia Washington office and he'll be talking about soil survey of the Olympic National Park 2020 progress and field season highlights. Max turning it over to you. All right, thank you. Getting my screen shared here. All right. OK, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about um, the soil survey of Olympic National Park, um, kind of where we're at and what we did in 2020. So brief overview, um, Olympic National Park is about 920,000 acres that occupies a pretty big chunk of area on the Olympic Peninsula in northwestern Washington. Um, it's a pretty unique project area, and that uniqueness really boils down to just the extreme amount of variability that we have um, throughout the park. So the 900,000 acres isn't a small project area by any means, but over about a 50 mile transect, we have nine different um, soil temperature and moisture regimes. Um, we have precipitation that ranges from down in the 20 inch um, area of the northeastern part of the park in the rain shadow up to about 180 inches in some of the, the coastal river valleys and out on the coast itself. Um, elevation ranges from sea level up to over 8,000 feet on Mount Olympus. And then we have a ton of variation in our landscape and landforms um, as well, as well as the, the vegetation and ecosystems um, that correlate to them. So we have ocean beaches and the accompanying Sitka spruce belt. Several different, um, several different communities of temperate rainforest, and then we also have subalpine and alpine meadows, um, and even active glaciers as well. So there's kind of a lot to account for, but it makes for a pretty neat challenge from a from a soil mapping standpoint. So this last year, we completed the first year of a five-year interagency agreement between the Park Service and NRCS. Um, but prior to that, about four field seasons or partial field seasons occurred between 2015 and 2018. Um, and during those field seasons, around 600 site and pet on observations were collected. Um, most of those observations though were collected in areas that either had vehicle or relatively short day hike access. Um, and as you can see here, most of those observations are kind of concentrated in the northern portion of the park. So, as we started our, our five-year agreement, we decided to focus our efforts in the southern area of the park where there is relatively fewer existing observations. Um, and coincidentally, there's also less um, road and, and day hike access as well. So this area does require a little bit more of the backcountry travel in order to access. So prior to the field season, um, my colleague Lizzie Carp um, and myself pre-mapped about 225,000 acres in this southern southeastern portion of the park. Um, 
We're pretty fortunate with this project to have LIDAR coverage for just about the entire project area. So we use the LIDAR hillshade, LIDAR derived contour and slope maps, as well as um, ortho imagery, a landform map given to us by the Park Service and a climate zone model breaking out our different temperature moisture regimes um, to get our pre-mapping done. And then most of our map unit concepts and pre-mapping polygons are pretty much based on uh, the groupings of landscape and landform within the different temperature moisture classes. And then some of our, our landforms that are a little bit more expansive, like our valley walls, um, we have additional breaks within those, those classes to account for surface cover variations and variations within um, slope shape and slope class as well. So before I get into what we did this field season, I thought I'd introduce the, the crew that was working on this project this last summer. So um, Eric Dahlke is the office leader of the Olympia and Mount Vernon Soil Survey offices. Aaron Kreutz is our ecologist in Mount Vernon. Lizzie Karp and myself are soil scientists based out of Olympia. We also had Luke Noble, who's an Earth Team volunteer um, based out of Olympia. And then Zach Allen is actually a archaeological technician with the Park Service um, who accompanied us on our trips uh, to satisfy the cultural resource monitoring requirement um, by the state and by our interagency agreement. So the beginning of the field season was, was a little bit challenging. So as, as everyone's aware, you know, the first wave of the COVID pandemic kind of set in in like March, April. We were planning on beginning our field season in April, um, but Olympic National Park occupies land in, in four counties and is adjacent to seven or eight tribal reservations as well. And so all of those jurisdictions had various COVID precautions and restrictions in place. And so the Park Service's response was pretty much to just initially close Olympic National Park for, for all purposes, um, including uh, researchers, like ourselves. So that delayed our field season about a month. Um, eventually, you know, we, we uh, coordinated with our contacts at the park and we were able to get access for day use purposes only. So all the campgrounds and backcountry areas remained closed. Um, thankfully, we found a small motel that was willing to accommodate us and, and we caravaned five vehicles along some of the roads into the park. Um, got some observations off the roads and then also worked off of a couple of the trailheads um, just via day hike. So we just worked the first like four or five miles of a couple different trails that we had access to. Um, you know, the, the roads that we were on and the trails that we were on, because the park was really only open to researchers at this time, we kind of had the whole place to ourselves. So um, we had a lot of really neat wildlife encounters and it was kind of nice being able to work in solitude in these areas that are normally fairly busy. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we kind of worked the fringes of the park via day hikes. So we spent a lot of time working up the Quinault River Valley, um, focusing our efforts on the alluvial terrace um, soils and map units, as well as the debris aprons. So here's a soil that is featured from one of our alluvial terraces. Um, we've kind of separated the terraces in this project into three groups. Um, this soil is pretty indicative of our, our second group terrace. So this terrace is like just above our river wash and gravel bars that, that flood all the time. So this soil is occasionally flooded. Um, we have about a foot or so of like fine loamy material overlying sandy skeletal um, material. The vegetation on these terraces is, is um, pretty typically just like red alder and willow. Elevation is pretty low because we're in the lower reaches of this this river where it's in more of its uh, depositional state as opposed to its incising state. Um, and, and that's really, it's kind of really that with this, with this soil here. Um, as the summer progressed, um, the park opened up its backcountry areas with a quota system in place. So we were able to work with the Park Wilderness Information Center to get permits in order to access the backcountry areas of the park. Um, we completed four backpacking trips that gave us access to some of the deeper, more interior portions of the park. Um, and we focused our efforts on those trips and getting observations in the higher elevation areas. So um, we focused on the, the cryic, eudic valley walls, our cirques, 
um, our, our benches coming off of the valley walls, um, lake basins associated with those benches, and a couple of the other higher elevation uh, glacially influenced landforms. So here's a couple photos from those trips. Um, this photo here is Lake Sundown, which we, which we camped at for a week and worked out of. Here's Lake Sundown from a different angle. Um, we got a lot of observations up in this cirque. Um, also at Lake Sundown, we came across an archaeological site, which was pretty interesting. So here's a photo of Eric and Zach excavating that archaeological site where we found some stone flake tools. Um, and here is a soil that is featured from that from that um, that Cirque's alpine meadow. So we were kind of expecting the soils on the Cirque's to be like shallow or moderately deep, just based off of the uh, the rock outcrops coming off of the the wall of the Cirque, and just kind of the nature of how glaciers carve out landforms. Uh, but once we got up there and and got holes dug, we were finding very deep soils with really high root concentrations to a pretty low depth. Um, based on the, the, the really wet climate and the organic input, base saturation is really low. So we have an umbric epipedon. Um, the, the soil here, as with just about every other soil we came across in this project, is loamy skeletal, pretty high rock carbon content. Um, and the vegetation community is pretty typical of our, of our subalpine, alpine meadow. Um, with some aster, arctic lupin, meadow rue, bittercress, a um, few other grasses and flowers as well. Um, there's some blueberry up here, there's some columbine, so really pretty sites to be at in the summertime when everything is flowering. So here's another soil um, featured from our, our valley walls. This isn't exactly the most exciting soil profile in the world, but it's pretty indicative of about like half of what we're finding on these on these valley walls. Um, you know, it's, it's a thin over horizon, a thin A horizon overlying the cambic, loamy skeletal as with most other soils. Uh, this, this site here is pretty representative of like our mesic valley walls. So a little bit lower elevation, 45% slope, um, pretty representative forest community with dug fir, western hemlock overstory and some huckleberries, flower and ferns in the understory. Okay, so as the summer transitioned into the fall, the weather gets a little bit more unpredictable in the Olympics. Um, you know, the nights start getting pretty cold and we get periods of rain in there as well. So we had an opportunity to do some work in the northern portion of the park, which was really outside of that fiscal year 2020 focus area in the south. Um, but there was con some construction going on out of uh, Port Angeles, and there was like a backhoe pit open, um, some cultural resource monitoring associated with that construction work. So our crew spent two trips working out of Port Angeles, um, working out of a hotel. Um, the Port Angeles area of the park is pretty, pretty neat in that there's actually road access to some of the higher elevation areas. So we were able to get some observations in the cryic zone um, you know, relatively easily because most of that area of the park requires several nights of backcountry travel to get to. Um, and then we also did a car camping trip. Um, we camped right at the Graves Creek Trailhead um, and spent a few days working along that trail, um, focusing on the debris aprons of that uh, drainage. So here is a soil featured from those debris aprons. I, I saved this one for last um, because these debris aprons were my favorite areas to work on this summer. Um, the, the slope kind of levels out on the debris aprons relative to the valley walls above them. Um, and since they're below the valley wall, anyways, they're in more of like a water collecting position and that, that lower slope, you end up with a little bit more infiltration as to runoff. Um, and a as a result, you get these really distinct um, spodosols that develop on these debris aprons. So this one here is one of the more photogenic ones that I came across this summer, but a really distinct albic horizon overlying the spodic. Um, you know, relatively low to moderate elevation. This site here is really on the fringe of our mesic to frigid forest community. There's a mix of the dug fir hemlock as well as the silver fir, which is kind of we're loosely using as a frigid indicator for this project. Um, and the understory is you know, pretty representative of a lot of what we're seeing in the Olympics as well. 
So despite you know, the beautiful landscapes and the photogenic soils, you know, the Olympic the Olympics do pose quite a few challenges. Um, and when I tell friends and family, like, you know, what I do and this project that I'm working on, they're all very jealous. But, um, you know, make no mistake, hiking and backpacking for work is definitely different than hiking and backpacking for fun. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of weather issues in the Olympics. It's, you know, it's referred to as a rainforest for a reason. Um, the terrain and some of the trails that branch off of the main trail systems are, are pretty difficult to navigate. Like I've mentioned a couple of times, just about every soil we've come across is skeletal, so the digging conditions aren't always super easy. Um, we do have wildlife to deal with, everything from bald-faced hornets and uh, yellow jackets to deer chasing me out of the pit during the rut. And then on top of all that, you know, the COVID restrictions and precautions added an extra challenge. Um, you know, park access and coordinating our access to the backcountry was a bit of a chore. Um, and then on top of that, a lot of a lot of gear that is normally shared, things like backcountry stoves and you know items from our soil kits, we had to carry all of our own individual gear, um, which added you know weight to our packs as well as volume. So, despite all that, though, we really did have a productive and enjoyable field season. We got nine trips done in total, about half in the front country, half in the back country. We got 121 site and pet on observations documented um, from which we developed a bunch of new component map unit concepts. We were able to complete 120,000 acres of mapping by the end of the fiscal year. And then in a couple months afterwards, we, we continued um, developing map unit concepts and tweaking our line work. Um, and since then we've completed the mapping for this, this whole southern portion, so about 220,000 acres. Um, most importantly though, we got a really good understanding of the soil landscape relationships in this portion of the park. Um, and it gave us like a really good baseline understanding of how our, our pre-mapping lines and how our, our mapping at concepts, you know, on paper apply to what we're seeing on the ground. Um, so moving forward, we're gonna work counterclockwise around the park. So this next field season, we're gonna focus on this Eastern, Northeastern portion. A lot of the concepts um, from the southern portion will apply, but as we move east, northeast into this area up here, we get into the Olympic rain shadow where the precip really drops. Um, so these areas are actually Zarek instead of Udic. Um, so we're, we're expecting you know, to find some different soils and vegetation communities, and we're looking forward to, to making sense of all that um, and you know, completing mapping for the rest of this area as well. And hopefully I'll be able to share what we find with everyone next year. So with that being said, um, I'll take a quick moment to thank my colleague Lizzie for helping me put together parts of this presentation. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. So we do have a couple of questions in the in the chat. Uh, first okay. of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, one of the questions you did mention soil moisture regimes. Uh, have you installed soil moisture data loggers? Uh, for yes. Working at, at those regimes. Yeah, that's a good question. So some of the work that was done between 2015 and 2018, we had 12 um, data loggers with uh, soil temperature moisture probes installed in various locations throughout the park. So we used that to make some of our, our climate breaks, and then we also used um, a model derived from PRISM data as well. Great, thank you. And then uh, one other uh, regime question, uh, is your coastal regime isomesic? It is, yeah, the coastal regime is isomesic. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> And you showed uh, some uh, um, some of the wildlife, but there was a question on, had you seen any bears out there? You know, we did, um, quite a few. So, so black bears in the Olympics are, I don't want to say bears are harmless because obviously they're not harmless, um, but they're really skittish of people. So every time we saw one, it was usually the back end of them running away. Um, but in the beginning of the summer, when we were pretty much the only people behind you know, gates on some of the roads into the park. Um, there was one week that we saw, I'm pretty sure it was the same bear, but every morning driving to the trailheads. Um, so yeah, a lot of wildlife, a lot of bear, a lot of elk, deer, grouse, it's a 
pretty diverse park in that regard. Okay. Um, oh, and one more question just came in. Um, they're not familiar with that area. What does the Olympic rain shadow mean? Ah, the rain shadow. Okay, so I can, let's see here if I can go back to my screen sharing. Um, oh, man. So the moisture in the Olympics comes off of the coast. I'm unable to get back to my presentation. But the, so the weather comes off the coast. Um, the Olympic Mountains are relatively tall, so the moisture gets caught up in the mountains. So the, the eastern side of the mountain range doesn't really get the moisture that comes off the coast. So it's a, it's a rain shadow. Um, so it's a lot drier on the eastern side. Um, kind of illustrate it, but I'm unable to get out of this Teams thing and back to my sharing. So I, um, I apologize, but if someone wrote that question down, I can I can send like a screenshot of, of a little bit of a better illustration. But yeah, it just it just refers to the moisture being caught up on the western side of the Olympics and and uh, the eastern side being a lot drier. Yes, and it is in the chat, so you might want to refer to it there. And this okay. this will be recorded also, so people can can take a look and they can review that that map. Gotcha. All right. Thanks again for your presentation. Uh, and just personally, it's nice to see uh, my home state of Washington again. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that's one of the advantages of these presentations is that we can see new country and we can also see country that we have been over maybe numerous times, but uh, never saw it from certain perspectives before. So I thank all of the presenters today and I uh, look forward to the next one. Let's get the uh, your ideas for presentations of your own in. And we will look forward to a next webinar on May 11th. Thanks for your attention and your attendance. Bye, folks.